Welcome back to Evolutionary Psychology. Let's investigate more deeply into human mating strategies. We have explored some ideas about what men and women look for in a potential partner, such as the provisioning hypothesis, which suggests that following a shift towards meat in the diet and a sexual division of labor, our species began to form long-term pair bonds, with males investing heavily in their offspring compared to their primate relatives. Let's shift our focus now to think about our own decision-making process to set the stage for more advanced study of human mating strategies. Think about your thought processes when you see someone who attracts you versus when you see someone who doesn't attract you. Does your attraction seem like a conscious choice or an automatic reflex? If it feels conscious, how do you choose who to pursue? If it feels unconscious, which attributes and cues do you think trigger your attraction? Think about the mating strategies in the following video. Do you recognize any of this behavior in yourself? How we decide when to pair up and with whom is a riddle that evolutionary psychologist Douglas Kenrick has tried to solve for decades. If we all just went for good genes, everyone would be unhappy if the guys didn't end up you know, with Jennifer Lopez uh, or some other fashion model. They would just stop then, and the women would stop if they couldn't get Brad Pitt or some extremely handsome guy. In real life, people have to match up with one another. How does this matching up process work? To find out, Dr. Kenrick gathered 10 men and 10 women from a fairly average range of physical attractiveness and prepared to perform a few experiments in human social dynamics. First, he stripped away as many differences as possible between the guinea pigs by dressing them in identical and sexually neutral outfits. Okay, now you're gonna play a sort of a, a mating game. You all have a number, as you can see. You can't see your own number, but you can see the other people's numbers. Offer your hands to someone, and if they accept it, then you've paired up and you walk back to the back. Uh, if, the, if the person does not accept your offer, then you'd move on and offer it to someone else. Again, the, the task being to try to get the highest number that you can and realizing that you have a number on your own head that they are responding to as well. The numbers drawn at random are meant to represent desirability, one being least and 10 being most. In the real world, where most of us don't know exactly how attractive we are, we tend to aim high, trying to snare a 10. Then, gradually, we work our way down to someone who will accept us. Some of the people are trying and not getting paired. Uh, the two people who are fives have paired up with one another. It wasn't like the tens perfectly matched and the ones perfectly matched, but you did get a correlation. The people with the high numbers were able to hold back a little bit longer, and they got more offers. The people with the low numbers didn't get any offers. And that's sort of what happens in a real mating pool. David Buss of the University of Texas has spent the last 25 years researching many more mate choice criteria. Duplicating studies going back at least to the 1930s, Buss and his co-workers sampled around 10,000 people. And they included subjects from every habitable continent, 37 different cultures. They presented men and women with a list of 18 characteristics that they might find desirable in a serious long-term partner. These include financial prospects, social status, attractiveness, ambition, and sense of humor. Respondents rated each of these attributes on a scale that ranges from zero for irrelevant to three indispensable. And you might want to try rating these for yourself. While uncovering differences between the relative ratings between the sexes in a single culture is clearly of interest, the conclusion may only be culturally specific. However, in large-scale cross-cultural studies, universal similarities might be taken as evidence of a species-specific response. And species-specific responses are important to evolutionary psychologists, since they may be taken as evidence that they are related to the evolutionary process. 
So what have Buss and his co-workers discovered? The findings can broadly be divided into long and short-term mating preferences and are summarized in this table. In exploring this table, we can see that there are a number of areas in which the sexes are similar or differ in their responses, and the degree of difference between them is shown. Cross-cultural variation is shown in the last column and is useful for indicating likelihood of evolution involvement. At this point, it may be useful to tease out and explore some of the figures under a number of topic headings in relation to the proposals that evolutionary psychologists have put forward. The mean scores suggest that women rate social status, industriousness, and financial prospects highly in potential male partners, and that men regard such features as of lesser importance in women. Moreover, it is well established that men of high occupational status are able to attract and marry particularly attractive women. Evolutionary psychologists claim that since ancestral females invested so highly in their offspring, they would have benefited greatly from choosing mates that were able to provide for them and their offspring. Although women in all cultures favor these characteristics more highly than men do, the degree of difference between the sexes varies between cultures. Women in India, Iran, and Nigeria, for example, value financial prospects more highly than do those in South Africa and Holland. Eagley has uncovered evidence that the preference for males with resources is negatively correlated with the degree to which the women of a particular culture have access to financial resources. In other words, in some cultures, women have to have preference for males with resources since they are unable to gain them themselves. Evolutionary psychologists generally see human behavioral adaptations as structured to respond contingently to local, social, and ecological factors. Let's have a look at some of the science of choosy women. The reason women are choosier about men is because sex can be much costlier for them. Men can have sex and walk away. Women could face nine months of pregnancy and years of childcare. Women want good genes and deep pockets. A good analogy is this. If you're going to go out to eat in Los Angeles tonight, you're going to spend $200. You'll read the restaurant reviews. You'll be very careful, and you'll be very disappointed if you don't get a really good meal. If you're going to spend $5 and get something off some guy on the street, you'll be happy with a lot less. Now, from the perspective of evolution, Men have the option, all mammalian males have the option of a $5 dinner. Females do not. Women's desire to share the burden leads them to search for clues beyond simple physical attractiveness. Clues to a man's status, wealth, and overall suitability as a partner and protector of her and her brood. Researchers in Austria have shown that women can actually change their perception of a man based on the car he drives. They asked women to rate pictures of the fronts of cars just as they would rate photos of men. Car faces and the form of car fronts actually affect um, our perception of them and which personality we would attribute to this car. Women actually prefer cars which uh, show dominance and power which could also have something to do with the fact that we assume that this kind of car is safer and um, it's usually the more expensive type of car. A lot of what goes on in mating is truth in advertising. People are basically trying to say, here's, here's what I have going for me, and they try to amplify it. I mean, he might not be the most attractive, but when you find out, you know, that he's got it together, he's got swag, he's got style, he's a top dog, that makes me want him, you know, opposed to the other ones, because he's a top dog. The bottom line is you need a tight car, a nice car, to get a nice chick. Men prioritize physical attractiveness, women prioritize status. So clearly, status, if a man has status, it can make a big difference. While both sexes demonstrate a clear preference for physically attractive partners, Cross-culturally, males rate this more highly in a partner than females. What males find attractive in females is pretty universal. They like large eyes, good teeth, lustrous hair, full lips, a small jaw, and a low waist-to-hip ratio, the hourglass shape. Although there is cultural variability in a number of features, such as overall weight, color of hair, and height, the characteristics that are claimed to be universal have one important feature in common. 
They correspond to youthfulness. According to Robert Trivers, men in the past who found fertile women attractive would be likely to pass this preference on when in competition with men who found infertile women attractive. Trivers' theory of parental investment predicts just this difference. But men face a problem that women do not have when it comes to choosing a fertile partner. Women have a limited period of fertility. Whereas a man may be fertile from early teens right into old age, a woman is fertile from perhaps her mid-teens only until her late 40s. A number of studies have now uncovered a clear relationship between signs of general fertility in women and what men find sexually attractive. Such signals are related to high levels of circulating sex hormones necessary for fertility, estrogen and progesterone. And these in turn are correlated with clear skin, full lips, lustrous hair, and a low waist to hip ratio. The relationship does not, however, work in reverse, since given a man's lengthy period of fertility, there would not have been the same pressure on ancestral women to seek out signals of youthfulness. In fact, as we saw above, since women have a clear preference for good financial resources and a high social status in men, then it may pay them to seek older partners who are more likely to have climbed the slippery pole of success. Studies demonstrate that men generally look for women who are younger than themselves and that women generally prefer older men. The fact that men look for increasingly younger women relative to themselves as they grow older may well be a mating strategy that is unique to humans. Other primates, such as chimpanzees and orangutans, appear to favor older, more experienced females. Human male mating preferences may have resulted from an almost unique feature of women. That is, they can expect a lengthy period of life beyond their fertile years. Why women become infertile in their mid-years is a matter for speculation. One possibility is that given how arduous childbirth became following the evolution of bipedalism, it may have paid women to shift their investment to their grandchildren beyond a certain age. So unlike other primates, men have to determine whether the potential partner is in the age range to potentially bear the most offspring. Arguably, ancestral males who chose females of childbearing age who had the longest period of fertility ahead of them would have an advantage over males who were unable to do so. Fertility refers to the likelihood of a female producing an offspring from a given mating. The number of children that a person of a given age and sex is likely to have in their future is called their reproductive value. This may appear a pedantic distinction to stress, but for males making a long-term commitment, it may be of great importance. A woman of 30 might be as fertile as a girl of 16, but the 16-year-old is likely to produce way more offspring in the future than the 30-year-old. We should note that, although women do not rate physical attractiveness as highly as men, they do consider it to be of some importance. However, there is a fair degree of cultural variability in the importance that women place on physical attractiveness in men. It appears that women place greater emphasis on physical attractiveness in parts of the world where parasites are most common. Since physically attractive cues such as asymmetrical faces and bodies are believed to be good indicators of parasite resistance, then it may make sense for women in these parasite-ridden cultures to be more choosy about partners on the basis of physical attractiveness. Romantic love was long thought by social scientists to be a recent invention of Western culture. If evolutionary psychology has achieved anything, it is the destruction of this myth. Love may not be easy to define scientifically, but it is certainly something that everybody can experience. Both sexes report love as an essential requirement for long-term partnership, and both sexes rank it close to the maximum of three. If a man has a surplus of resources but deserts a woman immediately after sex, or a woman is very beautiful but has multiple sexual partners, then in neither case will their partner be satisfied with the outcome. In other words, for long-term relationships to work, both partners require signals of commitment. However, forming an enduring pair bond is a very rare state of affairs for a mammalian species, so what purpose might love serve? Signals of love may provide this commitment. Signals such as promises of undying fidelity and dependability are also rated very highly by both sexes. Signals such as buying gifts for a partner or listening to their woes. In other words, channeling time and effort into a relationship is what people in love expect from their partners. 
if the ultimate function of falling in love is to produce offspring in which both parents will invest, then the sexual imprinting that we call love may be a feature which sexual selection has led to in our species. Chastity in Buss's study is defined as no previous experience in sexual intercourse. Chastity appears quite low down the list for both sexes. Crucially, however, it is substantially more important for men seeking a long-term partner than for women. By rating no prior sexual experience as a relatively important criterion for long-term mate selection, males may be attempting to reduce the possibility of cuckoldry in all placental mammals that embryo develops inside the female uterus. This means that whereas an offspring that a female gives birth to must be hers, it may not necessarily be that of her long-term partner. Since females know that any offspring they deliver must be their own, we can expect chastity in a partner to be of lesser importance to them. In the case of chimps, bonobos, and baboons, females give off visual and olfactory signals when they are ovulating. However, ancestral human females, in contrast, began, at some point, to disguise their ovulatory signals. Whereas in other primates, a male may be able to pay close attention to a female during estrus and possibly engage in mate guarding, for ancestral men who had to deal with other matters, such as hunting, there was an increased potential for cuckoldry. Some evolutionists have even suggested that this increased possibility of cuckoldry may have been the very reason that marriage was invented, since it acted to increase a male's certainty of paternity. Some anthropologists explain differences in chastity and in sexual permissiveness in general in terms of random differences between cultures, which may suggest that it is free from evolutionary influences. This is part of the standard social science model and is often referred to as the arbitrary culture theory. It is true that cultures do vary in how sexually permissive they are, but such features of human life also vary within cultures over time. Since the sexual revolution of the 1960s and the invention of freely available and reliable contraception, being a virgin bride has become less common in the West. And it might be argued that since women have been able to engage in sex with comparative freedom from its reproductive consequences, their attitudes and behavior have become more similar to those of men. In the Scandinavian countries where premarital sex is least frowned upon, the provision of welfare systems with regard to supporting unmarried mothers is the most generous. This is true of Sweden where women enjoy greater economic independence from men than anywhere else in the world. Perhaps economic independence is a precursor of sexual independence. Apart from a partner who is in love with them, both sexes want someone who is emotionally stable and of a pleasing nature. Moreover, after love and dependability, these personal qualities are the most highly rated by both sexes. Perhaps we all want a partner who is going to show kindness towards us. Forming a long-term relationship with a shifty, unreliable person of appalling disposition would not have boded well for our ancestors. Cues that suggest kindness, however, would certainly be regarded as conducive to mutual investment in offspring. In summary, most of what people want from a long-term partner is surprisingly similar between the sexes.